Greetings and salutations, listener. It is I, Eric J. Chucky, here as always with my dungeon master. Is that too gay? <laughs> Maybe just a little. Uh, uh, the boy. Hey. And uh, tonight we are joined by a peanut gallery and my lovely wife, Brandy. You may recall her from the Two Nerds podcast on Guardians of the Galaxy. If you haven't already listened to that one, go now. I'll include a link. You just gotta click it. Hi, Brandy. Hi. I couldn't be your dungeon mistress. Well, well, well. Um, I'm reminded of a mediocre Bernal Floss song. <laughs> Less gay, but I don't want to be in the room anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's get the, uh, the fun stuff out of the way. Um, please remember to like, comment, favorite, subscribe, share, circulate the links, man. Uh, follow us on Twitter. And, you know, again, if you guys really want to get in on that forum, let me know in the comments and I will start posting the links. Um, I'll start posting the links either way when it's ready. Uh, head over to Super Blizzard's Bandcamp page. His Shining Was Auto Track Let's Get Hardcore is our theme music. And he gave it to us for free, so the least we can do in return is get him some of them sweet, sweet mun muns. Sweet, sweet money dollars. Woohoo! Money, 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 money. Um, uh, you want to start us off here? Yeah, uh, hey, you know what? Let's let's shake it up. Why don't you start talking first? So recently, Wizards of the Coast has been working on a new edition of Dungeons and Dragons, helpfully titled just you know Dungeons and Dragons. I was in on the beta for this, actually. We didn't have time to run a game, but I did get the books, and when I had time to read it, I liked what I saw. Uh, forgive Brandy, she's a little under the weather, so if you hear more hacking than normal... I'm just trying so hard to cover it. No, it's okay. Don't, don't, don't hide your sickness. Own your illness. Praise be to Papa Nurgle. For he gives us many gifts. So... Mild the long story short, eventually we decided that although we don't actually play a lot of straight D&D anymore, we would grab the new player's handbook when it came out and look over it, see if it was worth anyone's time, maybe do a podcast on it, maybe not. I personally wasn't very excited, but things have gone so well that we decided that a podcast would be in good order just at a glance. Um, I personally haven't even made a character yet, I've just been looking over the book. Let me just say up front... I'm going to be giving just my absolute barest opinions based on what little I've read. I'm not even all the way through the book yet because I'm reading it end-to-end. End. It's fairly thick and we only got it a couple of days ago. But these two, Brandy and, and White here, have both made characters and are currently participating in a campaign for well, the new edition. it hasn't actually started. Was it just so, character creation? Yeah. Um, we had a couple of uh, newbies with us, so we kind of oh. show them the ropes. It was should, nice. uh, should give you guys a new, an interesting perspective. I'll get with the uh, the fella who's uh, running our game and see if he's interested in me promoting his link a little bit. Uh, he runs a blog, but uh, if he's not, this never happened. There is no game. There is no DM. Anyway. It was all just my insane ramblings. It's fine. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, what are your initial thoughts? I like this. I like this a lot. Listener, some of your personalities, Ultimo, may have seen my Facebook before. Uh, you may have noticed, if you were one of those personalities, that I posted a link about books that had affected my life recently. The last entry was Dungeons and Dragons, and I talked a lot about how Dungeons and Dragons specifically has influenced my life. One of the reasons that book was on that list, one of the reasons I had been reminded of how much D&D had affected my life, was getting to read this player's handbook again. I was getting to read this player's handbook for this new edition, because... Alright, edition wars are kind of going to have to be a part of this. I didn't like 4th edition. Like at all. Yeah, we, we've thought about actually doing an edition wars podcast, because I... The longer I played 3rd edition, the less I liked it. Oh, I love 3rd edition. I know. Well, 3.5. They were so similar. I mean, like, if this we... is the thing that always fucking gets me. I say third edition, and people like to go, bup, 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 do you mean third edition or 3.5? They're right. basically the fucking same. Anytime forward in this podcast you hear any of us refer to third edition, we're talking about 3.5. Okay? If I want to mention third edition, like, original third edition, I will say that. If well, I want to mention Pathfinder, I'll say that. 
It wasn't the bullshit minutia fucking grappling rules or whatever it was, it was they the changed. The jump rules. Yeah, the <laughs> jump rules. That wasn't what ruined the game for me. I just want to make sure people know that I knew the difference between 3rd edition and 3.5. She just wants to out her nerd cred. Yeah, no, I can wave her, wave her eating all around. Yeah, it's in this in this uh, day and age of <laughs> stupid political crap. Oh, not go! There. I'm not going down the road. Have we have we ever addressed that? I think we did on the show once. Yeah, or yeah, that just on Facebook. No, no, we we addressed it on yeah. the show. Tiny we... reminder, just in case you are just joining us um, during the commercial break. Seamus beat the crap out of Randy Orton, and <laughs> it was really cool, and the only cool thing that happened on the whole show, and you missed it, you should probably buy the WWE app of the WWE Network. It's only, say it with me now, $9.99. Uh, no, actually, in case you're just joining us, we don't do serious political stuff on the show, um, because it's not fun. The Two Nerds Podcast is about listening to us complain about shit, share our opinions, and and go wacky. We don't do political stuff. Maybe we will someday on a separate show, but not right here, not right now. So we're still talking about D and D, right? Because I'm sick, and I want to make sure I didn't black out. And miss this something. is a fever dream. Please ignore the eyeballs sprouting out of my arm. What? 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 Um. So, complete at a glance, I I really like this. I really like this. This just at my absolute first glance of this edition, it reminds me a lot of third edition, and that's my well again three point five bowl. That's my favorite edition of D&D. I played 2nd edition, played some mutant hybrid of 2nd and 3rd edition. Uh, I don't want to talk anymore about that. <laughs> um, but I, I've played 3rd edition, 4th edition, and I hope to play 5th edition here. And 3.5 is my favorite edition of d and It is the edition I really had my best experiences with D&D with. And it's the edition that I think of when I think of D&D. Now, I recognize that any of the old-school D&D players in the audience who were there for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons and had that for many, many years before 3.5 came out... Present. Yeah. Just want to kill me when I say that, but it's it's facts. When I think D&D, I, three, I think 3.5, or I think Thacko, and then I want to shoot someone. Uh, Brandy, you as well kind of began with 3.5, right? Yes, the only other role-playing experience I had before meeting you was in high school. My cousin was a DM, and he was trying to explain how to role-play. And I'm like, uh, uh, uh. He's like, you can do anything you want. You can fly in the air and piss on someone if you want. And I'm like, I think I'm going to pass on this. <laughs> um... It's a weird world, high school. We were all kind of different people back then. I had antennae. <laughs> I was a much bigger asshole. I was skinny. And a huge bitch, if I recall. Yeah. We don't like that part. No, we don't. Uh, we'll do a, we'll do a, you know, <laughs> Two Nerds Daria episode some other time. Um, so what do you think of, uh, of the new edition of D&D, Brandy? What are your initial thoughts? Uh, my initial thought is it's beautiful. Like, the artwork... I would agree, except for two things. The cover, which is a lovely piece of art. I just don't think it's a good cover. Um, I don't know. It's dynamic. It sets up, you know, it sets up the world a little bit. Sets up what kind of game you're, you can be looking forward to. It's, you, you know, obvious player character here, fighting much larger, more menacing threat. I wish there were more than one player character. Yeah. Right? I mean, and that's that's part of the point I was about to make. That's That's really... Well, first of all, oh, there are. Look, here in the corner. Oh, yeah, there's another... Wow, that is not very well made. Like, that is not... That should be... Have a lot more attention drawn to it. Well, and this picture might not be so bad if it were, like... If there were some sort of border or something. Monster Manual. This should be the cover to the Monster Manual. Yeah! That's a fine cover for a Monster Manual. But the Player's Handbook? No. And, like, a lot of the people online are complaining, why is there not a dragon on the cover of Dungeons & Dragons? I mean, you got that giant in there, who it's at first... Dragon Skull, I think. At first glance, I thought the giant was just some barbarian dude. And so I you was saw like, the weed little people? Yeah, and I was like, oh, there's tiny people. He's probably a He's bad wearing guy. a dragon skull, I think. Does that count? No, I don't think it does. But well, it's it, actually, it's a dragon hide, even. Cause it, it's got, like, the wings, his, his little cape bits. It's a nice piece of artwork, and it, it just uh, it's just not a good cover. Not what I would do from a composition standpoint. Side note, giant wearing, dragon, wearing a dragon hide, like, cloak... That's pretty neat. That's yeah, pretty badass, Giant. <laughs> uh, thing two, hobbits. 
Oh my god, the hobbits in this book are freaking hideous. Halflings. Or, they don't uh, have the rights to hobbits, they're halflings. Well, <laughs> technically... They're, uh... Technically, Hobbit is, like, you can use the word, because, uh, I'm pretty sure Warhammer uses Hobbit. Being a Hobbit, I take offense to the way they're portrayed in this book. But anyway, <laughs> the artwork itself, other than Hobbits, halflings, whatever. There was an old rule of thumb an ex-girlfriend of mine once said, uh, if you are an evil person, you call them halflings. If you are a good person, you call them Hobbits. Because <laughs> it's, it's... Oh no, where are the hobbits? We must protect the hobbits and then find the halflings! Kill them! <laughs> yeah. Now I just have the tape and the hobbits died and got stuck in my head. And what do you use hobbits? Um, but anyway, there's, the artwork is gorgeous. There's not a lot, I don't think there's any, um, gigantic boob women in like, bikini male, which I don't care. That's fine, it's gorgeous. You've played that character before. I have, several times. Um, but it's, they're more realistic. Like, there's one of a mage that's shooting some sort of spell out of her hands, and she looks exhausted. That's nice. Portraying how magic takes it out of you, and and they do that in the rules, too. Like, like there's, there's a... Something. Oh, fucker, go ahead. There's a lot of spells in the book that you cast, and it's like, you can't do shit all until you, until you take a long rest. And that's... That's really cool. A funny thing, that's not just mages. I'm reading Undead, I haven't even gotten to Wizard yet, which is just blasphemy for me. Wizard is my favorite D&D class. I'm sa- it's the last class in the book, so I'm like, I'm waiting for it, leading up to it. It's, it's nice. But I've gone through a bunch of the classes. A bunch of the classes have stuff that they can do that is unique, that they can't do again until they've had a long rest, where they can only do a certain number of times before a long rest. A.K.A. they have encounter and daily powers, like from 4th edition. But they're not encounter and daily powers. They're done in a more realistic way. They're, they're done, done third edition style. Oh, and a lot of this does speak of third edition. I mean, really, it's I, I likened it reading through the book when I when I went through all the book at a, just a brief page through, kind of check things from here to there before I started reading it end to end. And it's like they took third edition, fixed a lot of the problems with it, and then ladled like a light fourth edition sauce on top. This this book, uh, this new edition of D and D, is to third edition as Essentials was to fourth edition. Yeah, that's a great that's a great comparison. I, I mean, you... it was really the first thing I thought. Dude, I love the wizard. Yeah, that that picture cool. Oh man, like this is I mean this isn't a visual medium, so I can't show you guys, and I wish I could. Because it's like this really cool old black guy with like a big gnarled staff and he's got like pouches and scrolls and He's got this look bonds. on his face like, I'm going to wizard you. <laughs> he's got like this knowing look on his face. I love it. The bard is also awesome. The bard <laughs> is awesome. With his um, base. Yeah, I think it's a chick actually. Yeah. Here's that wizard picture you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, where she looks like she's just like so <laughs> this tired. Is, this is all I got, man. I got, I got one last flower. Oh, no, that's, that's a monk. That's a, that is a monk. Is this what you were talking about? No, no it's, it's later. It's on this side of the book, I think. Okay. This is, uh, it reminds me of when a comedian does a live album and inevitably they do something visual and laugh and say, we'll just have to put a note about that in the liner notes. Um, <laughs> at this point, everyone looked at the book and then talked about it for a while and it was incredibly boring on in an audio medium, but screw you, I like this book. <laughs> well, well, while well, the boy is looking at that book, um, Brandy, as someone who has played alongside you, as someone who has been your DM, um, what, what would you say, or rather I would say, that one of your biggest stumbling blocks as a role player, uh, is getting through the hurdle of character creation, both in terms of actually putting data on paper and filling in the bubbles and all that good stuff, and kind of concepting a character. Um, you're the kind of person who... Like, starts with a bare bones, not even a skeleton, an armature, and then rolls up the sheet, and then once you get into play, like, they spring fully formed from your forehead. Yeah, you make Athena like Zeus. It's just, there's no character until play until play starts, and then a person shows up. I'm getting better at that, though. I well, started making more of a... Well, it takes time. I mean, you know, compared to the boy, and especially compared to me... You've been making role-playing game characters for all of eight years. Almost eight years, yeah. Um, <coughs> but God, I have like ten years in now. I don't want to talk about me. Uh, but uh, 
fifth edition, th- this new D and D. I come home and find you like with four pieces of paper around you, and then the book, and going, I'm doing this. <laughs> I think I'm gonna play with this, but I can't count. And this is no slam on Brandy. Everyone has their own hangups regarding. Oh Brandy. yeah, yeah. But I can't count the number of times. A campaign has been delayed because Brandy doesn't want to make a character. It says a lot of good things about this book that it, she was able to pick it up, look at it, and with no prompting make a character on her own. That she was super excited about. And she about. wanted to. Because it speaks very well of the game. I hate making characters. I, whereas it, the, the fact that I, that I have taken time to read through all the classes before flipping straight to wizard and just making one of those, that also speaks well of the game. Because normally that's what I do. I flip right to wizard, I find out how to play wizard, I make one of those, I worry about the rest of the stupid classes later, I play the best class first. Um, I think it has a lot to do with, I'm um, sorry to interrupt you. No, you're right. Um, the magic bubbles that appeared on the screen have confused me. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I changed our super offensive screensaver for yesterday's party. Okay. Um, it's just a giant floating dick, Ultimo, don't worry about it. The third edition of 3.5 making a character is very complex. Not complex, but, like, time-consuming. Yeah. And I... To be completely honest, I started role-playing because you role-played. And I was just doing it because, hey, this guy that I like, you know, that I'm planning on boying a lot, plays this, so um, I should probably get into it, too, if I want to continue hanging out with him. It was a bonding exercise. And I find a lot of people, not just ladies, people... Uh, get into role playing because their weirdo friend is like, dude, come do this thing with me. And they're like, you know what? I like this guy. Might as well. Sometimes you get that magical sort of, yes, I would like to play pretend with paper in your basement with you. <laughs> uh, that sounds like the best time ever. That was me. Um, but usually it starts with somebody who is in the know that either gathers other people who were in the know or drags them kicking and screaming into the know. Um, internally kicking and screaming. Because I'd already, um, it was already kind of, well, this guy seems interesting. <laughs> um, it, it's all right. You can call me a stalker dick murderer. We, we had my Game of Thrones. Uh. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Let's go ahead and go hang out in this guy's basement and play pretend. It's not at all weird that he's, you know, you know, weird. So let's just do this. And then turn out to be a lot of fun. But character creation was always so long and so in-depth, and I'm so ADD anyway when it comes to sitting still and doing something. Oh, yeah. Um, that it took a long time. So basically, for the last eight years, I will tell Eric, this is what I want, make it so. Number one. And I rub my beard, leg over a chair, and comply. And she... Oh, she <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Just, I understand what you said. You were making references to Riker. Yeah. What it sounded like you said was, I rubbed my beard leg <laughs> over a chair <laughs> and complied. I am, I am a grasshopper man, <laughs> and when I rub my beard leg over a chair, <laughs> it makes the sweetest song. Crick, 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 crick. That is his soothing song, <laughs> to let Brandy know that he understands her request, and then he doesn't. <laughs> oh man, I wish we were more famous. I want fan art of grasshopper me. <laughs> someday, babe. And, um, once I told you what I want, you would ask me some questions. If I'm like, this is stupid, we'd change it. And then we'd play. But with this one, I sat down. And I leafed through, you know, the races. And I leafed through the classes. And then something new in this one are backgrounds. Yeah. And they are... Very interesting. I really yeah, like I'm actually going to look through those really quick while you guys talk a bit. Explain those a little, because I haven't gotten to them yet. I keep hearing them mentioned in the various things, like, hey, do this from your background. Pick your background. Cool. Um, well, after you pick what you want to do, you can pick a background. I picked Charlatan for my gnome character, my um, rogue gnome, because I figured Charlatan would be great. Um, it gives you a little bit in depth, and it gives you oh, extra skill proficiencies and other language. Well, maybe it's not so much extra skill proficiencies as it is where you get your skill proficiencies from. Um, oh. You also come with some um, items, and um, it also comes with charts that if you need help making a background for your character, like why they do what they do, you can roll and pick. All right. 
This is my weakness. I can't resist a pretty face as mine. Um, you can roll a scam for a charlatan. Um, mine is I have all kinds of different disguises, and it just helps people who are not the most creative really build a backstory for the character and get into it. Or people who are just trying to roll a character really quickly. Oh, yeah. I yeah, mean, I mean, like, I, I, I don't have... All right, I have no problem making characters. I do it for fun. I have, like, six role-playing game characters in docket for another role-playing game system that I want to play. But I... I, I might do this. I might just roll up a, a character sort of <coughs> from the dice tables. I, it'd be, I think it'd be a fun experiment. That is something from old school role playing. Less D and D. More. I like, mean, yeah, like the first and second editions, kind of, but not to this degree. Excuse me, but more like Palladium games, um, where you rolled everything. Uh, you came up with some weird shit. <laughs> What's something from Palladium I recognize? Uh, that you would recognize? We've never played it. They did uh, We've Rift. We've never touched Palladium game. Uh, or Rifts. Rift is the MMO. Rifts is the Yeah, they've done RPG. Rifts. Uh, you, have you seen that Ninja Turtles role-playing game I have? Yes. That's Palladium. Who did Slay? Slay was actually um, uh, its own little thing. I don't remember the name of the company that made it, but they were... They made Slay. Yeah, they just made Slay. That was it. I and mean, it was like three dudes. Was Good game. Cool. It was. Yeah, uh, I, the combat mechanics leave a little bit to be desired, but it's a very intriguing setting. I find that's the case with most role-playing game systems, though. Combat is... Well, you know what, and... <sighs> the whole point of my role-playing system... Uh, advertising mode activated. The whole point of my role-playing system is to be succinct. The dice are fun and awesome, and you should be able to roll them if you want, but... I hated when we would do, like, three, four, five-hour role-playing sessions and around hour two just be like, I rolled a four. I did ten damage. Okay, he takes ten damage. It's always bad when the game devolves into math. Yeah. Um, that was a big problem in fourth edition. It's one of the many reasons I didn't like, not early fourth edition, levels one through ten <laughs> fourth edition. Yeah. All right. This is me completely going nerd on you people, but it's the name of the podcast. You should have expected it. <laughs> Levels 1 through 10 of 4th edition weren't 4th edition. They were an MMO, but a well-designed one. It was well-balanced. It was fast-paced. Everything works well. Once you get to, like, level 30 in 4th edition, level 20, oh my god, every battle is just this chugging diesel train. It's unstoppable, but... Oh, Christ, does it take forever I've heard, um, and I don't, I, I'm sure I'd heard this comparison before, but everybody was so thick with, it's an MMO hatred that you didn't hear much else. They made an incredible minis game. Yeah, it's they a did. war minis game. Because, like, they've got so many rules for combat, and combat is fun. You should probably expect to get through one, maybe two fights in a night. It, once you're beyond 10th level, yeah, it's just because there's so much grind. There's so much crunch in that system. Yeah, there's and so it's, much... it's cool. You can have fun with it. That's the whole point. That's why the powers, they're very juicy, uh, I believe is the term in video game design, but it, it feels good in uh, the role-playing game, too. You're using stuff that's doing stuff. No matter what your role, no matter what your class, you are affecting the battle in a meaningful way. Unless you're a wizard. <laughs> Which is ironic that, um, the system, the fighting system with the 4th edition was so good because when 4th edition came out, I had just gotten over my hack and slash yeah. phase. Yeah, we moved into a long, still not quite over, uh, story-driven role-playing thing that would have better suited Vampire the Masquerade. And we go to this incredibly combat-heavy, what is essentially a minis game, because with 3rd edition... We all have decent sense, decent senses of spatial relations in our heads. We didn't need a map and minis to play D&D. With 4th edition, you need a map and minis. You need a grid. You need that to play it accurately because there's so much specific movement and powers. And it's like the difference between playing with a puzzle... And playing with, like, on the very, very far end of the spectrum, a, a paddle ball. 
Paddleball is much simpler. It does take skill to play correctly, but in the end, it's not very complex. You could look away while you're playing with it, maybe do other things, but paddleball ball while you're watching TV or something. Yeah. Whereas, like, a very intricate, like, a a, a, f- a brick a, puzzle, the or, kind of thing you have to take apart one piece at a time. Or a 3D puzzle. Or a 3D puzzle, or a Rubik's Cube. You have to concentrate. It's fun. Everything you do means something. All the little levers and twists and pulls mean things. But it's way more complex. I think they went too far Rubik's Cube. The other too far the other direction also isn't a great idea. No, I mean, especially if you're trying to market a role playing system. It's, but they also when they went so far into the combat, the fact that they basically ignored or there wasn't room for, I should say. There wasn't room for rewarding out of care or out of combat actions. Um, there wasn't really room for rewarding out-of-combat spells. They were there. There were skill challenges, which I thought were neat. They gave you ideas on how to negotiate. But so many of your powers were pretty much only usable in combat. And they hid all the non-combat spells out of the way you know, in a little-used section of the book. That they really did not even try to, and to get players to go towards the ritual caster stuff. That's where all the non-combat spells were. And they weren't really even all that good, or... There weren't a lot of them. And they didn't feel good to use. Tensor's floating disc good. It was just not terribly effective. And Now, this is coming from me, and I will say this flat out. I don't like 4th edition as a player at all. I love DMing 4th edition. It is the easiest shit in the universe to DM. It is. It is point-and-click adventure easy to DM. You just... I can DM, I have DM'd games in incredibly different settings with 4th edition with no rules changes. Just slightly reef off all the powers and you can make a Star Wars game that runs perfectly. We just use the Psionics handbook. Yeah, and then those are Jedi. Those are Jedi. And, and it, basically, if we wanted to do anything else, I mean, you know, it's, tiny, it's not hard. It's tiny house rules here and there. I had them fight, you know, giant mech droids, which were secretly white dragons that I just called mech droids and renamed the powers they did. And it, it was, was designed that way. I mean, yeah, that was a just, beautiful part very, of the 4th edition. It's very easily retrofitable, which makes it great for DMing. I have no idea what DMing this new one's like. I know DMing 3rd edition was something I never even did because it looked like such a huge pain in the dick. Yeah, it was. It was. Like, the fact that they use the terminology challenge rating in this new edition... Scares you? Scares the shit out of me. Challenge rating. Not even Pathfinder fixed that. Oh my god. Challenge rating is... It's a, it's a harsh one. Yeah. Oh, your players want to fight something? Oh, you want to put an encounter in place? All right. You better know complex fucking algebra. What's that? You don't? Get good, nerd. Yeah, you, you don't know complex algebra? Well, you're either going to ruin your players' lives, or they're going to make your dungeon a sad 45-minute romp. And while the Emmy 4th edition was fun, playing it felt like I was studying. Because yeah. I had note cards. For all my powers. Because if you're playing with a group and you're all playing one character out of a book... You well, especially the, the fourth edition group we played with, which involved my mother and uh, a long time ago, my little sister, who weren't and still aren't, like, major role players. Yeah, but even when I was playing fourth edition, I used power cards. I mean... Oh, they're they, so much more convenient. They give you powers in yeah. card form. I mean, Christ, sometimes I would just print them off from a PDF we have of the book... Um, and, and cut them out. There. Power's written. Yeah. But you were saying about it being, uh, it complicated. Felt, it felt like homework. Because I had to, oh, I've already used this one, I can't use this one today, I put this over here, and have I used this? Oh, I can use this, and I do crap damage, unlike 3.5, when I can just grab my 8d6 from my great sword that I've broken, and shake and roll and I do all this damage and then I shake and roll and do all this damage and then I shake and roll and do all this damage. Yeah, she's, uh, she she cut her teeth as a 3.5 fighter and for those of you who know what a 3.5 fighter does, charge and full attack and. That's, that's what you do. I was a dragon shaman. You were a fighter. Let's be honest here. Uh, the dragon shaman is pretty secondary. Yeah. Although the acid spit in the face was, uh, was your primary method of retribution. 
But yeah. I will beat you with my sword if you are anything from a chipmunk to a great dragon. What's that? You've pissed me off. <laughs> yeah, you were you were a fighter. Um, she that's that's charge and full attack in. And you know what? Credit where credit's due. I cut my teeth role playing as a second and then third edition wizard. And <laughs> oh god, fourth edition made me feel weak. Like I might as well not have been there for the boss fight. I can go to have a cup of tea because I Yeah. They in third in fourth edition they made wizard into the ads guy from yeah. from an MMO dungeon from an MMO <laughs> group, you know the guy who the off tank who wrangles up all the ads and takes care of them while everyone else fights the boss. That's the wizard in fourth edition until the essentials line. I love playing an essentials wizard because that's an actual fucking wizard. Look, I understand. The wizard doesn't have to be the most powerful member of the party. That would make more sense, but whatever. Um, it doesn't have to be the most powerful member of the party. It should still feel like someone who has mastered arcane things. A, a no, someone who is knowledgeable in things others are not knowledgeable in. It should feel like Dumbledore. Not like the janitor? I was going to say Professor Janitor. <laughs> not Professor Janitor. Yes, oh, Professor Janitor. <laughs> my job wasn't to fight Voldemort. My job was to clean up the rubble afterwards. It was... You were a squid, that's what you felt like. It just wasn't, it wasn't a wizard. <clears throat> Speaking as someone who cut his teeth as a second edition rogue, with those delicious, delicious percentile skill checks, and then tried to play a rogue in third edition, where the wizard goes, You know everything you do, I do it better. And the bard goes, Yeah, me too. That's not true. I can only unlock doors so many times a day. Well... I digress. Um, fourth edition kind of does hurt the wizard too hard. Your wizard should excel at what a wizard do. Your rogue should excel at what a rogue do. And while it makes perfect sense that a wizard would come up with a spell to unlock a door, you're building a game for people to play and have fun. Are you ever going to achieve perfect balance? No. Your rogue and your wizard and your fighter, if they get into a weird Mexican standoff, should probably... Well, die when the wizard unleashes a spell. Here's the thing. And I will explain the boy's concept of what a wizard should be in a role-playing game system if you want the wizard to be balanced. In a fantasy story, wizards aren't balanced. No. This is just facts. In the fantasy story, Gandalf isn't balanced. He's like 20 levels higher than the rest of the party. And so they have to get him off screen for the party to be meaningfully challenged. Well, Gandalf was a DMPC who was just there to make sure the party didn't fall wide. Didn't fly off level. the rail. <laughs> didn't yeah, didn't fly completely. That off too. The rail. When you have two guys who are like, "Let's get some lunch." Yeah, lunch sounds great. Yeah, you have those two assholes who don't know what role playing is, and they're just like, "Let's get some fucking carrots." <laughs> <laughs> There's a cornfield over there. We could probably get some corn. Saving the world over here, boys. Move along. Uh, we can save the world after second breakfast. Oh, super. But <laughs> so, but they have to get Gandalf off screen. It's the fakest laugh ever. Good. No, that was a real <laughs> laugh. It was the most real, hysterical laugh I've ever had in my life. Anyway, in the Harry Potter series, Dumbledore, the <laughs> wizard. They all are wizards in quotation marks. Dumbledore's the wizard in that book. Um, the wizard is unbalanced, so they have to get him off screen for the hero to be challenged. If you want to make a wizard balanced, if you want to make them a meaningful part of the story, because that's what D&D is. It's a game and it's a story. If you want to make them a little meaningful part of the story, they should be not quite the bard, but they should be pretty good at a lot of stuff for a while. The wizard should be able to meaningfully replace any one class for, like, once a day if they know they're going to need to replace that class. And that's the important part. So what you're suggesting maybe is um, a wizard who is like a... A wizard should be Batman. You should not... Not as good as Batman. 
But I'll get. I will Ultimo, explain. Oh, Ultimo, I'm very sorry. You can't see the look on my face. <laughs> well, I, I didn't see it either. Didn't it's all right. It's not worth it. Uh, <laughs> glorious. Not as good as Batman, obviously. But a wizard should be able to plan for things, and if planned properly, should be able to do most of what they need to do. But that's why it's balanced, because what you do to challenge a wizard, speaking as a DM, is you give them things they did not plan for. In even measure, and that asks your DM to be a bit better than your average DM is going to be. Like, get your wizard spell list. Have him show it to you at the beginning of every day. That will let you know what you need to throw at the wizard, what plot twists you need to give to give the wizard meaningful challenge. But if all you do is throw plot twists at the wizard, you're also being a shitty DM. You also need to make sure that you're reading off the right chart when the wizard encounters a donkey. That was a rogue. Yeah. But still... I thought you David Spade's character was a wizard. No, no. David Spade with pointy ears was uh, was an elf rogue. Boy went violently against type. He never liked elves and never played a rogue. And he was like, fuck it. And I was like, you know what? I'll try an elf rogue. And I'll play him as a, just kind of a misanthropic dick, dick weasel. Like most elves and most rogues are. So he ended up being David Spade with pointy ears. That this wasn't the first time I ever DM'd. And she... Convince me never to play an elf rogue ever, ever again. Because he didn't last a combat. A combat, I might add, that was against a mule. He got killed by a mule at level 5. It was my fault. I, I rolled his hit points as his damage. So we're looking at about 5d10 to a 5th level rogue. Who is an elf and a whose third constitution edition, yeah, is kind of shitty? Took a minus two to con, and I didn't roll the best hit points. <laughs> Speaking of minor thing, this edition does um, just to get us a little bit back on topic. <laughs> I went off on. I, I was going to try to rein it in, but thank I you. I got. A, I went off on a wizard tangent because I love wizards. Um, well, so I'm not going to oh, make any well, sense. Oh, oh, you know what a wizard should be? The greatest superhero of all time. I meant that they should be able to plan for shit, asshole. <laughs> it's, that's what a wizard is, is planning. A wizard, is Magi- a wizard isn't MacGyver. A wizard is... I'm, the bat- he's, I'm trying to think of anyone who does planning as well. Uh, like Yagami, I guess. A wizard should be a wizard. I believe the point you were making is that if you want to balance your wizards, they have to kind of suck unless they know what they're doing. And if they know what they're doing, if they know what's coming, they should be really fucking good. The Whereas, only problem with that when it comes to game balance is that, I mean, you might as well ask your, your DMs as a publisher, be better at what you do. <laughs> well, DM's kind of a higher calling. That's that's me being, you know, full nerd again, but not every role player can DM. Effectively, I like how, uh, and I'm not criticizing you here, but I like how in about a discussion about D and D, there is a higher level of nerd you can reach. Yes, <laughs> there clearly is, and I am clearly there. <laughs> we all are. Oh, get on my level. Do you even? <laughs> do you even DM? But anyway, a thing I like, just a small thing I like this edition does is, if you know you're the person, like my friend White Raven here, who rolls shitty a lot. Most of the time, in fact. I roll great when it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's just whatever it matters, shitty, shitty rolls. This edition of D&D gives you some options. For instance, they do rolling for hit points beyond first level. A thing I love that is returning, by the way. That's a good little progression method. But if you think that you're probably going to roll a lot more 1s than you do 12s on that d12, guess what you can do? You can just take the average. That is really a lot of what this book does. Uh, I remember when I was playing 3rd edition and Unearthed Arcana came out. And it was kind of like a set of, hey, do you want to play D&D like a little differently? It was a lot of house rules, a lot of rules borrowed from other... Um, published works under the open gaming license. That were very popular that they just decided to use. Yeah, like armor as damage reduction instead of as AC AC bonus. bonus. Um, Shit like that. This book includes a lot of that in there. We said earlier that backgrounds, and even your race and class, can sometimes identify what kind of gear you're carrying around. Or you can roll for gold. 
you can do the advertised traditional roll 46, drop the lowest, and assign your stats where they may. Or you can do the point by system. Or think, they give you a predetermined set of scores to use. Yeah, if you'd like, like instead. Fourth edition did. The one thing, the only option they don't give you is 3d6 in order. Because, well, those extra two hit points on, those extra two ability points on average are very important to people. Well, I mean, but if you, if you know about it, you can do it. Nobody's stopping you. No. It's, you know, it's at your option. They're much less, oh god, you have to do it this way, it has to be this streamlined, otherwise the entire game's broken. Like, 4th edition. Look, alright, maybe a part of the problem we have with 4th edition is, I don't think we ever used the pre-given ability sets. No. No, we never veered from 46 drop lowest, and that's not what they want you to do in 4th edition, they want you to use the predetermined sets, damn it. And I know why, that game is balanced rigidly. Yeah, is, I mean, we were always fighting stuff that was at least two levels above us. And that 46 drop lowest was probably probably a big part of the reason why. Right. That game is balanced on a knife's edge. It's perfect. I can't, that's the one thing I can't dispute about 4th edition. It is perfect balance. And bad balance at the same time. Because everything's balanced, but everything feels the same. And that's not how you want things to be balanced. I like how we said we weren't going to talk about edition wars, but that's basically what we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes. Well, there's not much... I mean, this is just the one book, and... It is, but there's actually a lot to talk about. And honestly, okay. backgrounds, I think, are a great place to begin. Because, as Brandy was saying earlier, you you can kind of inform your character based on the background. You don't have to. It says right in the book, look, if you just want to pick one, fine. If you want to make up your own shit, just check with your DM, fine. Um, but it does give you those options. And, and the point I was trying to get to in the first place, you rolled stats, Brandy, and then you made, like, what? Your race choice, your class choice, and your background choice? Yes. And then, if you don't want to roll for gold and buy your shit the, the old-fashioned way, and just take what it says in the book, your character's done. Pretty much, you do your AC, you do your... Yeah, it's just math from that point on. Oh, and it's not even that much math. You pick your skills. And your skills are often chosen for you or given by a limited pool. Yep. A very limited pool. Well, on average, what I saw was two out of a possible five or six, maybe. And then you get a couple more from your background, maybe a couple from your race. You're given most of them. Um, I love some of the unifying mechanics they did. I love use of proficiency bonus... To replace base attack bonus, because they can give a much more uniform experience, because it looks like, and again, I haven't read through all the classes, but it looks like, by and large, people all go from the same proficiency bonus table, but they're proficient in different things. That means that everyone who's doing things is exactly as good at the thing they're doing as everything as everyone else is at the thing they're doing, but they're not all doing the same thing. That's really important. You know what else I like? Mm. The fact that you can use um, two hands without taking a feet for it. Oh yeah, dual weapon fighting. You can yep. just do it. Yep, and your your just your second hand does not take your bonus modifier. It's, it's just not as effective, which is not. Nice. <coughs> I all right. At first, I didn't like this. It rankled as a as the munchkin in me really is who got mad at this. I'm gonna be honest, but. They don't let you, as a player character, put your ability scores above 20. At all. At all? At all. Until, in one instance, I saw that you got four more for two, for two things at 20th level, which is the max. It goes 1 to 20, not 1 to 30, for some reason. But it goes 1 to 20, and maybe until 20th level, but mainly at all... Your ability score max is 20. It doesn't go higher. That's a great way to keep things from getting fucking ridiculous. Which is the thing I hated about 30. <laughs> yeah. Cause... After a certain threshold. And I'm not even talking about twinking. I'm not talking about Pun Pun or any other legends of the internet. Yeah, the ability to climb up your own asshole. And do infinity damage. Yeah. Um, coming out of your own asshole and creating a, an explosion. Uh, whatever. I'm not actual talking thing. about that. Yeah, actual things. Um, I, I'm speaking specifically of the fact that your skill checks 
through nothing more than going, gosh, I really want to be good at this skill, could get so absurdly high that not only could you not fail, but you could perform ridiculous feats of cockery. As if, for instance, my uh, another third edition character who was outside my... All right, I played a lot of wizards. I'm going to get that out of the way. Um, another third edition character I played who was outside my normal my normal modus operandi. One I had a lot of a lot, a lot of great times with was a monk. And in 3.5, monks are incredibly underpowered. That's pretty universally acknowledged. Yeah, 3.5 fixed the monk from being a god. To a useless pile of shit. Until around level 16. Even then, just didn't get as good as other classes at stuff. I got my, you know, DM. White here was nice enough to make up for it for me by giving my monk additional spell-like abilities that made up the power gap. But monks are in 3.5 are just underpowered. But even though I was playing an underpowered class with only decent stats, not amazing stats, just by taking what little skill points I had focusing them into the things I wanted, and putting max possible ranks into them every level, by, like, 15th level, I was fucking ridiculous. I could climb up a flat marble surface, freehand, with no magic, and just chill out at the top of it with little to no effort. I mean, it was like the grappling I could take wolf. ten on that. <laughs> and it was... There was another character you played that was a, a polar bear. That, um... <laughs> hey, alright, no, let's... He was Volibear. I didn't know before, about him. Before Volley existed. He yeah. was what I called an Ursatar. He was... The real inspiration for him was the same as the inspiration for Volibear. He was an armored bear from his Dark Materials series. That's what I've he was based on. I've never seen it, but boy, I wanted to play one, so I, I statted one up. This is a superhuman ability I have, the ability to stat things. I should give him a concept, and he goes, bam, here's a balanced version of it. He yeah. makes the stat blocks. Straight up. Yeah, I made you uh, an abortion once. Yep. Anyone who knows what that fantasy series is, it, not only was it balanced, it was fun. Yeah, yeah, what that was, was that? pretty fun. The um, Bells guy. The guys with the Bells, yeah. That was an awesome character. Yeah, it was a pretty awesome character. Um, I love that you're going to make me whatever I want. I really want to turn that into a sex joke, but uh, this is an R-rated show. Not, not beyond that. <laughs> um... Uh, where was I? Right, uh, the grapple rules. Uh, you didn't have anything weird. I didn't get you magical items yet. No, I, I had no magical items. I was level six. I was level six. Uh, you were an unstoppable grapple god. Yeah, because I, I took that grappling pr prestige class, and I had good stats in strength and constitution, and because, all right, as much as I hate to admit it, because it makes my favorite class look like a bunch of assholes, 3.5 edition was wizard edition, Wizards were the only thing that even stood a fucking chance against me because they could fly. If I could get to them, they were dead. Because I just, I picked people up and turned them into pretzels. They didn't even have a shot. They didn't have a chance. It was completely broken. So broken, I had to stop that campaign. I could have played another character, but we just decided to move on. Yeah. Uh, I made some bad calls as a DM. Now, you know, maybe, maybe this edition is going to do that. I mean, that's something you really can't find out until you played it. I played third edition for years before I started to go, what the fuck is all of this? It took me a long time to get to that point. You need to be able to get under the hood of the system and really start fucking <laughs> things before you can start breaking it. That's why this is a preliminary look. But preliminarily, it seems like the way they the way they kept balance on a more 3.5-ish scale, because this book is much more 3.5 in spirit, the way they kept balance was to fucking put a lid on shit. Yeah. Like... Base attack bonus only really, the, the proficiency bonus only really goes up to like plus six. The damage bonuses you get for stuff, like the barbarian's rage damage is like a plus, plus ten at max level or something. The hit points are pretty small. It's, it, they just put a lid on all the shit. Because up until you get past that lid in 3.5, everything's perfectly balanced. How does crit work in this game? You know, I didn't look into that. You guys. Yeah, why don't you take a look at that? Uh, there's a feature I like, but I'm super butthurt about, um, called Advantage and Disadvantage. Um, basically, when you have advantage in a situation, you roll twice and take the better result. When you have disadvantage in a situation, you roll twice and take the worse result. It, somebody did the math, amounts to about a plus or minus 3.2, etc. 
which is pretty close to the old rule of plus two, minus two. And they use this as a hard rule for, like, everything. If you are extra good at something, you have advantage in it. If you are bad at it, you have disadvantage in it. I like this. I am butthurt about it because I was using this mechanic in my RPG. I say we keep using it. Oh, oh, yeah, I plan on it. I'm probably going to change some names to make it look less... uh, yeah, because we were using it first. Screw you. Yeah, I done published. Well, there have been other games that used it before. Held third edition used it sometimes. But we, it was, we it's were using a pretty, it as a It's a pretty mechanic. core function of the game. Yeah, but so whatever. Whatever. We're keeping it. Um, That's what I liked about third edition. Um, I wish I could find Laura's character sheet. I got it somewhere. Because at the end, she was oh. on like 8d6 plus, what, 25 damage? All right. Yeah, that's something that I think they lost sight of in 4th edition. You know, uh, in an MMO, the logic is toward bigger numbers because bigger numbers are more satisfying to do. Look at all the big numbers I have. Isn't that cool? I have so many numbers. It's effectively no different than the numbers I had 30 levels ago because all of the enemy's numbers have gone up too. But I have so many numbers, you guys. In 4th edition, they did a similar thing. It wasn't in the thousands but they ramped up your starting health, which was actually something I liked, because I had too many party wipes at low levels in 3rd edition, going up against shit like wolves. I have the critical hit information. When yeah, right. I just want to finish my point. Um, but 4th uh, edition ramped up the numbers of your damage. The, flat. the flat numbers. Yeah, it ramped flat numbers. You didn't ramp up... It didn't ramp up you know, it didn't ramp up other numbers. Um, it didn't ramp up the dice you were rolling. In in a tabletop game, um, the, the visceral feeling of picking up all them dice and throwing them on the ground and going, yay! In the fourth, sorry. No, go ahead. In fourth edition, you could, you could crit, but it wasn't as satisfying as critting a 3.5. Yeah, you, you did flat damage. You just did your max. Which mechanically is sound, but... but mechanically, it's more points. numbers. So what What are crits now? What does the new edition have? <clears throat> when you score a critical hit, you get to roll extra dice for the attack's damage against the target. That's literally the first sentence. Um, roll all of the attack's damage dice twice and add them together. Then, to add, then add any relevant modifiers as normal. To speed up play, you can roll the damage dice at once. For example, if you score a critical hit with a dagger... Roll 2d4 for the damage, rather than 1d4, as normal. And then add any relevant ability modifier. If the attack involves other damage dice, such as damage from a rogue sneak attack feature, you roll those damage dice twice as well. So it's it's 3rd edition scripts. Yeah, it's just 3rd edition scripts. But it didn't mention rolling to confirm. That'd be nice if that were just gone. Yeah, that was... Was that a third edition thing or was that a fourth that edition? Was a third edition thing. Thing. That was a third edition thing. Yeah, I can't remember. Because I we house ruled that out pretty early on. Just because yeah. that was lame. I rolled a twenty, I crit. Screw this you. is, you know, another thing I compared this to, this edition of D D, to uh, League of Legends Earth mode. Um, one of the things they said uh, as a joke when they were talking about Earth mode in League of Legends, Google it, U R F Earth, um, was that they were going to give every champion infinite mana, because running out of mana equals running out of fun. And this game lets you do so much of what you want to do, and then balances around it. Like, okay, there's a warlock. I almost rolled a warlock for the game I'm in, um, because I like them so much. But then I realized you could totally worship Cthulhu, and I... Probably shouldn't do that in the same way that a Catholic priest probably shouldn't roll a, a priest of Jesus. It just oh. seems it just seems a little little <laughs> like there's self insertion and then there's there's that. Yeah. But uh, as as a warlock who worships an eldritch creature at level one, you can talk inside other people's heads. Level one. Like Brandy was saying earlier, with no feats, so long as you have two light weapons, you can dual wield. Why? Is it logical? No. Is it fun? Yes! Fucking do it! Is this something you're going to house rule out if we don't do it this way? 
Most certainly. Well, then let's just start from there. Oh, this is neat. I was reading into the hit points. They didn't do third edition negative hit points. And they didn't. No, they still have death saves. They still have death saves, but they didn't do fourth edition negative hit points either. If you get damage and you get to zero, if the damage remaining from that attack puts you to is more than your hit point maximum, you die. So say you have 20 hit points. So it's like System Shock without the System Shock. Yeah. It's 20 hit points. And you're down to 4 hit points. You take 24 damage. You die. You take like 23 that. damage, you live. You're at zero. I like that a lot. Yeah, and then you start doing death saves. I, uh, I never gave feedback for this, but they have taken a lot of ideas from my game. I, uh, I like that, because it sounds like when I finally have some uh, oomph behind Colt, I can put it out there, and people will appreciate it. But, um... Yeah, uh, man, there's so much more I want to talk about. We're already running down toward the last few minutes of the podcast. Um, I, I really like backgrounds. I mean, out of everything that's been added to this game, out of the revised classes, you know, I really like backgrounds. What would be nice, this is me personally, let me strip away my personal preference. They added all the right races to the core rulebook. They had the D and D races and Dragonborn to the core cool, to the core rulebook and Typhlings and Typhlings um, or Tieflings if you prefer. I prefer Typhlings. I prefer Typhlings as well. I um, prefer Typhlings. But uh, you know they they it's, it's human half elf elf half orc dwarf uh, halfling gnome. gnome Typhling Dragonborn. Is orc not in here? No orcs. The reason, the reason they're half-orcs is because orcs are so traditionally seen as nothing but mindless and evil, but lots of people wanted to play an orc-like race. Okay. They included half-orcs. They included half-orcs in 3rd edition. Um, honestly, I'm surprised they don't have a furry race in the core book, because like there are three major races that people homebrew that quick after a book comes out, and that's Dragon Race... Used to be called half dragons. Now they give them to us as dragonborn. Um, race with wings, which you can relate to. Yes. And some sort of cat person race. But whatever. Um, those are those are the races that should be in the core book. They even give you the rules for drow, um, which you know people are going to want to play that. Why wait to put it out there? This is what people want. Give it to them. I like that they go in and they say, look. Drist is really the only drow that is good, but if you want to play a good drow, there's obviously a precedent for it, so here's what you do. Mostly these people are awful. And I like how they say, look, these are the common races. If you want to get into Tifling and Dragonborn and Half-Elf, they're not so common. So, you know, bear that in mind. Um, yeah, I do, I do like that they noted that these races aren't as going to show up as often. So if, you know, if your elf walks into a tiny village on the outskirts of a kingdom, then whatever, it's an elf. We've seen elves before. If your tiefling does, people are going to react. People are going to be like, ah, it's a demon. It's a demon. Make the sign of the evil eye at it. Close your shop doors. Everyone hide. The beast, the beast is here. And I like that, too, because it facilitates that... Um that fantasy fulfillment, you know, I want to be the big scary guy, say so many people so often, well, here in the rules, you are the big scary guy, yeah, even though you're the same level one adventurer piss pot as everyone else, because <laughs> you're a tiefling, people are going to be like, ah, ah, demon. Um, gosh, what else to say, uh... The spell lists are back to old form. They oh, look really good. I, that's just, they've, they've taken a lot of the complexity that had, 3rd edition had out. I, uh, it does my heart good to see spell lists again. Look, uh, give me spell lists, please. I like what they've done with the feats. Uh, they're entirely optional. Yeah, they're entirely optional. You can take them instead of uh, attribute bonuses. Which makes sense, because you can only have 20s in attributes. So if you start with an 18... 
you get up to 20 in that, maybe up to 16 or 17 another one you need. If you don't want any more attribute bonuses, just start taking feats. Or if you don't care and you have good stats from the beginning, just take feats. Or if you have shit stat and really want feats, take feats. Um, there are way fewer feats, and they are way more powerful. Mm -hmm. So taking a feat seems less like, okay, it's third level, and I really should probably get the next in the fighter chain of weapon expertise trades, and more, okay, it's fourth level, I'm going to take a feat and do some awesome shit. They're more powerful, and they're a lot more specialized. Yes. Which I feel is also important. Well, and that, I kind of meant that by there being fewer of them. I do have one thing I really don't like about this book. Hmm. Um, they don't include ever burning torches in the end of the book. But that's my complaint. We can carry on this. Yeah. I blame third edition for that shit. Third edition uh, player's handbook had all your regular gear and then a little sampling, and it was like. Here's some shit you can buy if your DM is an idiot. Torches that last forever. Magic keys that unlock every door. Bags that are full of traps that you just throw on the ground and they become <laughs> a trap. Every character I ever made that was 3.5 had a never burning torch. It wasn't much. And why wouldn't they? Because, I mean, if they're just available at every magic shops are us... If the, every corner store, general store, has a has an artificer on staff to make torches that last forever, why would anyone ever carry more than one torch? You're not wrong. I'm just. It's it just one thing. It was the one thing that I always did, kind of like my signature thing. It wasn't expensive. It wasn't didn't break my character. I did that later. <laughs> yeah, that was your signature thing. Thanks very much. Uh, my signature thing is buying weird shit, I think. No, your signature, your signature thing is playing weird shit. Yes! And that was the complaint I was about to make. Look, those core races are the ones that should have been in the book. Oh my god, I'm dying for something different. I have played so much damn D&D &D over the years. It's like, I see those races and I go, I guess I want to play... I don't fucking know. Now, 4th edition had some decent different races. Later in expansion. Oh, I suppose the core book had a ladrin, but they were just elf plus. They were just high elves. And they had those big red people. Core book did not have red people. Oh. Unless you mean Typhons. No, whatever Marilyn played that with the big... Oh, no, you mean Devas. They were blue, mostly. Oh, oh they could be whatever color you want. Yeah, some some were red, some were blue, and they were in core book. Oh. They were yeah, they Player's, players Handbook, handbook. 3. We spent a lot of money on 4th edition for a game we didn't really like. You know, we did. We bought like 20 of those books and we did not really play nearly enough of that game to justify 20 of those books. But it was D&D &D and it was what there was, so... And we knew they weren't going to make any more 3rd edition, so... We knew Spork didn't want to DM any more 3rd edition, so get with the new hotness, I guess. Thankfully, this looks like it might be a better investment. That's nice. Yeah, um... That's about uh, my thoughts on the situation. I'd love to go into it more in depth. Um, I would love to go into it more in depth once I have more in depth to go into it. Once I've made a character, played some D and D with yeah, this that's we. I've got some things brewing in my head, percolating, if you will, um, for a campaign. So the next time we convene, uh, the dungeon master guide and the monster manual should have been out, um, and we will have played. So a fair amount of a campaign, I'm sure. Um, well, and we'll talk never, about some D and D. You never know with us. We'll say some just to yeah, that's true. Heads. Um, but uh, otherwise, that is about it. Um, if you're still listening, thank you for making it all the way through. Um, and this was turned out to be kind of a meandering one, partially my fault, I'll admit. Edition Wars are a real easy thing to get into for me, because I got lots of opinions. 20 minutes into the podcast. Let me tell you why Wizard is the best class ever. Which is really my life. They are the best class ever. Look, I'm sorry that you don't like it, but they're... They, all right, all right. Joke's beginning. I'm sorry that na that D&D rule sets feel the need to import, to enforce some sort of arbitrary balance between people who hit things with sharp stuff and those of us who rewrite the or the laws of the physical universe. Eh, you're wrong. Dragon's Shaman is the best class ever. No, I'm sorry, that's just incorrect. Dragon's Shaman is the best class ever. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if I must find any solace in what is no doubt to be the rest of tonight's conversation, it is that pithy arguing is better when nerds do it. Fuck it, let's go!